here in the room, which is testimony to our incredible uh, speaker today, uh, Susan Greeny. So, um, welcome to the spring term of the Yours uh, seminars. We have some fantastic talks uh, lined up over the next uh, few weeks on subjects related to digital media, um, museology, and of course, uh, larger forms of interpreting uh, the historic record. So kicking us off uh, is Susan, a senior properties historian <laughs> at uh, English Heritage part-time and also uh, on top of that pursuing her PhD. Uh, in Cardiff uh, part-time. We were just uh, talking about her long history uh, with English Heritage, ten, 10 years uh, now working at sites from large to small, at Stonehenge arguably being the, the well, most challenging, most complicated. Uh, she, she'll let us uh, know. Um, so uh, rather than blabbing on too much longer. I'll uh, turn it over uh, to Susan. Thank you so much for agreeing uh, to speak to us. And I think we're all looking forward to brilliant uh, and insightful talk on the redesign of Stonehenge's Visitor Center. Uh, thank you, Susan. Thank you. Well, I'm not sure I can live up to that introduction. <laughs> Okay, well, thank you everyone for coming, and thank you to Sarah for inviting me. Um, I guess what I wanted to try and do today is give a bit of a kind of warts and all um, idea to you all about the process of interpreting an icon. So um, how we went about designing mostly the exhibition, but the interpretive scheme at Stonehenge. And uh, to kind of give you a bit of an insight um, into the process behind that and kind of uh, the trials and tribulations of doing such a major project. Um, so, um, Stonehenge is a project that I became involved in in 2009, and the Vista Centre there opened uh, in late 2013, end of December 2013. Um, so, I just wanted to start. I mean, how many people have been to Stonehenge? I kind of guessing. Yes. Okay. Most most people in the room have been. How many people have been since December 2013? Okay, only a handful. Okay, York's not that far away. You all need to go and visit. <laughs> so um, hopefully you'll be maybe inspired to go and have a look uh, when you're next down south um, at the New Visitor Centre after my talk today. So um, let's start with the, the basics. Uh, Stonehenge. I'm not going to do any of the prehistory, any of the archaeology, any of the theory. Um, if you wanted that, you should have come to hear my talk at TAG. <laughs> um, so um, really today is really much more about the interpretation and the presentation of the site. Um, but it is an iconic site. It's one of those sites that everybody in the world recognises. And so with any project, interpretive project, presentation project, there's pressure. With Stonehenge, there was ridiculous amounts of pressure. There was huge amounts of pressure internally and huge amounts of pressure externally on the project team. And that was really partly because of um, quite complicated reasons. But English Heritage, as some of you will know, has recently split into two halves. Uh, English Heritage being the bit that I work for still, uh, Historic England being the bit that does not deal with properties and opening them to the public. So anything else that English Heritage used to do that didn't involve properties in any form is now under the um, remit of Historic England. And English Heritage, which is the bit I still work for, is now a charity. We are self-funded. And that means that we have to uh, raise enough money from sites like Stonehenge, from our guidebooks and from our admission costs to support all of the historic and prehistoric monuments that we look after in England. And that's quite a tall order. So in every single kind of departmental conference or anything during the process of doing this project, it, there was a kind of line where somebody went, and of course, Stonehenge is what we're all relying on to, do, to basically build, to bring in enough money to support the entire rest of the organization. And at that point, everyone would look around at me and my few colleagues and go like, that's you, that's your project. <laughs> so yeah, there was quite a lot of pressure. Um, on the other hand, we also knew that anything that we did was going to be better than what was currently there. And that was always something we could rely on as being in the darkest moments of developing the scheme, we could go, well, at least it's not going to be as bad as what's there now. Um, so this is a picture, an aerial photograph taken in 2012, um, probably familiar to those of you who went um, before we opened the Nevis Centre. Car park, coach park, uh, just across the road, 1960s and 70s porter cabins serving as 
a staff room. You, none of you will have gone in the staff room, but the staff room was literally a really leaky porter cabin with no room in it. It was horrendous and a shop. That was the only indoor space. There was a cafe that served uh, teas and coffees to outdoor people in the rain. And this is actually shown on a day when um, really there's not many people there. Normally, the car park stretched way into the National Trust land, uh, which was only supposed to be used on a seasonal basis, but towards the end was really being used every day. So you got this kind of view of Stonehenge uh, from across the fields. And these were the kind of facilities that everyone was passing through, which mm. is kind of a familiar site. It was there for many years. I kind of miss it in a way. <laughs> uh, and then you went through a ton tunnel with some um, uh, fairly old school interpretive reconstructions and you popped out the other side and you went to see Stonehenge and you traipsed around and you came back again. Most people were staying for about 30 minutes. And if you include the shop and the losing that, really, they were kind of literally walking around the monument and getting back in their cars. Uh, so there wasn't any interpretation. There was an audio tour and that was it. Uh, and there was a guidebook. So really there was limited space for explaining what Stonehenge was, for talking about the wider landscape, for providing education provision, anything that you would normally expect a kind of World Heritage Site to have. So, um, sorry, this map isn't great, but I thought I'd just give you an overview of what the project was doing, because it wasn't just a visitor centre. Um, Stonehenge is here in the middle, that blue triangle of land is the bit that English Heritage owns. And the major part of the project really was to shut this road. This is the A344, which used to run right past the heel stone. And in order to, to shut that road, there was a public inquiry, all very interesting background stuff that you don't really know, need to know about. But there's a long history before we get to the stage of even thinking about what to put in a visitor centre. So this road was shut in June 2012. And um, this section here at the end was put back to grass. Um, and the rest of it closed to public traffic. So the only thing that goes up and down it now is um, our visitor transit buses, uh, which take people from the visitor centre to the stones. And the new visitor centre is here at a site called Airman's Corner, which is within the World Heritage Site. This brown line is the World Heritage Site boundary, but it's just, uh, just inside it, and actually in a fairly kind of blank area archaeologically. Um, uh, the process of getting to that decision was kind of a very long one, and I won't bore you with it, but suffice to say that those porter cabins had been termed a national disgrace in 1975 and by 2012 we were basically no further on um, and there's been so many different projects to try and resolve the problems at Stonehenge that it's kind of it's a complicated it would be a whole lecture a very boring lecture in itself to go through them all um, suffice to say that as early as 1921 Alexander Keeler was discussing having a museum at the site to house all of the objects from William Hawley's excavations and um, there were various proposals in the 1970s and the 1980s. And there was a major project which really almost happened, which was to build a visitor centre up at Lark Hill, up here, um, which actually got to the stage of having planning permission and was designed um, to a fairly um, kind of complete design. Um, but it was given planning permission on the condition that the A303 went into a tunnel. And as you probably know, the A303 is not in a tunnel. And when that scheme fell through, um, it was going to cost something like 540 million pounds to do that road scheme and the government just said no that's too expensive and the visitor centre scheme that was kind of based on closing that road all just fell apart so that was in uh, 2007 that that road scheme was scrapped and that that visitor centre was scrapped so this particular project the one we actually managed to deliver uh, was begun in 2008 and it was begun as a kind of temporary solution actually it still is technically <laughs> A temporary solution so you may have heard in the news that the a303 tunnel is back on the agenda but in effect this visitor center here was designed to be a temporary solution before the a303 issue was resolved uh, it's not it's a permanent building um, but there were certain things that were done about the project which were tried to make it removable so for example the visitor center really doesn't have very deep foundations you could easily go in there and take it away and really there wouldn't be a major impact on that bit of the landscape it was sort of designed that you could remove it if you wanted to at a later date which is kind of nice when you're thinking about filling it with lovely things, but that's how it was designed. So the same architects called um, Denton Corker Marshall, who had designed the Lark Hill Vista Centre, were, were kind of also employed to do the Airman's Corner one. And so in a way, the first few years of working on the project were very much kind of like, right, we're just on the latest project. There may, this may not happen. This is something we have to go through again. Is, is doing these design stages and there were people who'd done so many different versions of the Stonehenge project before this one that it was kind of like it was I guess it was kind of like a running joke really within within the organization so um it wasn't really until 
actually work happened on site that it was kind of okay this is real this is a visitor we actually got diggers on site we are going to build somewhere that, that people are going to come visit so um <clears throat> As I said, I was appointed in 2009. Um, I'd already been working for English Heritage for about five years before that date. Um, and I had been working on three sites, so much smaller, unstaffed, free sites to visit. Prehistoric, but also medieval and all kinds of other dates. And so I kind of was shifted onto the Stonehenge project when it became a sort of reality. Um, and at that point, we already had a building design and we already had appointed our exhibition designers who are a company called Haley Sharp. And at that point, it was basically trying to start thinking about the stories that we're going to tell within the exhibition space. And I guess it might sound like a really boring, typical civil service response, but the first thing we did was produce this document here. This is the strategy for interpretation, learning and participation. Um, and that really work, involved working with a huge number of external partners. The National Trust own a lot of land in the Stonehenge landscape, uh, working with the RSPB, have a reserve at Normanton Down, Natural England, the local parish council, all these kind of partners and stakeholders and people who wanted to have a say and were in, had to be involved in the process. And um, also two local museums, who I'll talk about in a minute. And this included a visitor survey. What, what do we know about our visitors? Where are they coming from? What do they know? What would they like to know? Um, and underneath that document sat a number of other documents. This is how things work in civil service, I'm afraid. Um, but this basically is the interpretation plan, and that set out what we were going to put in the exhibition and what we were going to do in the wider landscape. There was also a learning plan, there was also a volunteering plan. And all of these documents, there was 10 boxes, as in like proper archive boxes, 10 boxes of documents went to the HLF for our HLF bid. That's how much work there was in just putting together the budgets and the proposals and everything. And that went into the HLF um, initially for a, a £5 million pound bid. Um, I'll tell you why, why that went up later. But basically, that was, that was a five, £5 million pounds worth of the project budget. I should say that the overall project budget was £27 million. Pounds. And at the start, that was basically split coming from three different sources. Uh, one, the HLF. Two, our own resources, as in our own commercial income to English heritage that we could spend and three money com coming from the government that changed a bit later on uh, and this is this i promise this is the most boring slide in my presentation it gets better from here on <laughs> this is a really boring project diagram but it's just to try and show you that the people involved in deciding what actually went in the exhibition and what went in the interpretation were part of a much 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 larger team so we're basically this is where i would sit this is the interpretation learning team and they're the people who decided what was going to go in the exhibition and in the education room and in the landscape. But uh, as well as that, you've got people doing a business plan, you've got people fundraising, you've got a number of different project boards, hugely complicated, very boring, lots of meetings. Don't need to go into it, but just so that we're just a cog in, in a big... There's this number of people, and these are the people that I work with most closely in developing the scheme. So there was a head of interpretation, so somebody who was there to represent really the visitor, the interpretation, thinking about design, thinking about what actually we might do in terms of the media and the different elements of the exhibition. We had somebody who was looking at the education. We had a conservator who was doing conservation work on the objects that we might display. We had me, the senior properties historian, rubbish job title, but basically the archaeologist. We had a curator whose role was very much to look specifically at the objects and negotiate loans and work out which objects we were going to put on display. An operations manager, somebody who was thinking about visitor flow, um, ticketing, that kind of thing. And somebody who was doing outreach, a community projects person. So as you can see from that, there's only one archaeologist, really. I mean, Sarah Lunt, who was the curator, she did a lot of work, but all on the objects. I was the only person who was basically kind of tasked with making sure that what we were telling people about Stonehenge was accurate and what everyone else was thinking. So it, it, it was quite a lot of pressure on me to make sure that we, we got it all right. <laughs> when I, when I, speak to people about the project there must have been hundreds of you working on it no that was me <laughs> <laughs> and when we appointed quite a lot of our contractors i'll explain a bit about that later some of them said and we said in the interviews how are we going to work with english heritage how we propose working with us is it by email is it by phone will you have meetings they said we'll have weekly meetings with the content developer with, with what they, they that's what they call me the content person 
um, we'll have weekly meetings with you. I said, I can't have weekly meetings. I've got seven contractors working on different elements. If I have meetings with all of you, I don't have any space left to do anything else other than have meetings with you. So yeah, the, there was kind of different expectations from people outside as to what was going on inside. Okay, so the archaeology. Um, as many of you know, uh, there's been a huge amount of archaeological research in the Stonehenge landscape over the last 10 or so years. Um, so back in 2009, when we started, when I started, the Stonehenge Riverside project, uh, Mike Parker Pearson and Co's huge project, which had led excavations at basically all the major monuments in the Stonehenge landscape, new dating, new findings, new discoveries, had really just come to an end. They finished excavating, I think in 2008, possibly 2009, 2008, I think they finished excavating at um, what they term Blue Stonehenge. Um, so there was that major amount of new information. There was also um, quite a major amount of geophysical survey going on. So the top, so the top images are from the Stonehenge Riverside project. This is a, um, a sm very small portion of uh, one of the hidden landscapes um, geophysical survey results of um, this is Amosbury 50, a barrow showing uh, some of the wooden structures that were seem to be emerging underneath it from that survey. Huge amount of new discoveries going on in the landscape. There'd also been two quite major excavations at Stonehenge itself in 2008. Uh, this one, which was the reopening of Aubrey Hole 7 um, as part of the Stonehenge Riverside project, which was to extract the cremations that had been deposited there in the 1920s, and a small excavation in the centre of the monument um, by Tim Darville and Jeff Wainwright, which was looking at the Blue Stones uh, as part of their spaces project. So one of the main challenges for the project was really to try and get a handle on all of this new research that was happening, because of course none of it was published, and in fact most of it still isn't published, <laughs> so, and there's all the post text is still ongoing on quite a lot of it, so trying to get up to date with all of that was a massive challenge. Uh, and in the meantime there'd been ongoing debates about um, the geological origin of the bluestones, there'd been ongoing thinking about the chronology of the site itself, lots and lots of things happening. So. One of the, the way that we decided to deal with this was to basically pull together an expert panel. And I'm sure you'll recognize most of the faces on the screen. Um, but basically, um, the way to kind of try and stay on top of all this research was to try and get these people together in a room every now and again, and to get them to help really advise us on what we should be doing, on some of the key questions that we still had. And um, I guess we met with them about 10 times in total over a period of about two years. Um, and it kind of was successful, although generally they argued a lot, as you can imagine. <laughs> and that wasn't always the most useful um, thing for us, although we did do quite a lot of good work with them. Um, and, you know, talked about various things to do with competing theories that they had. Um, and, and really, it was very helpful for me to have these experts and others to call on with specific questions about what we might present. Um, one of the key things we were trying to do is... Um, get away from the sense that Stonehenge is a complete mystery. You get this thing, particularly it was, you'll notice now our marketing material has changed, but before we did the project, it was all kind of Stonehenge is all mysterious, lots of dry ice, you know, no one knows anything about the past, isn't it all mysterious and interesting? And we want to try and get away from that a bit, not the interesting bit, and say, actually, Stonehenge is a really well-researched site. We know loads about it. Half of it's been excavated. We have loads of dates. It's a fantastic landscape, all of which has been researched really, really well. We do know a hell of a lot. But yes, there is a point you get to, and then there are some competing theories about the meaning of Stonehenge and why it was built, and et cetera, et cetera. So we tried to kind of take that as a theme running through the exhibition. So one of the things we had to decide on early on, um, don't worry too much, don't, you're not going to need to read any of this, it's just a, a map of the World Heritage Site. Um, one of the things we had to decide on early on was our boundaries. So how on earth, we had a basically a blank box, not dissimilar to the size of this room, maybe a little bit bigger, a blank box to fill with an exhibition about Stonehenge. Where on earth do you start? Well, number one, you have to kind of define what you're going to leave out, really. What are you going to focus on? Um, we were expecting people to come with absolutely no knowledge of prehistory, expecting people to come from all over the world, uh, but also expecting people to come from university groups and expecting people to come who knew quite a lot and were quite interested. So it's very difficult to know where to pitch it. Should we uh, talk about the Mesolithic? Should we talk about the fact there's a whacking great Iron Age hill fort in the landscape? Uh, how much do we talk about the Stonehenge Free Festival or the Druids? Or perhaps 
how much do we talk about Avebury and links to other prehistoric monuments? These are all questions that we had to kind of deal with. So quite early on, we had to define the geographical and the chronological kind of boundaries of the exhibition. So geographical limits are fairly easy. So we basically stuck to the boundaries of the World Heritage Site, but really we concentrated on this kind of northern portion of the World Heritage Site, partly because that's where, unless you want to really learn about leg down barrows, most of the really interesting Neolithic stuff is happening, but also because there's something called the A303, which runs across here, and encouraging our visitors to go south of the A303 and try and cross it was a bit of a no-no. So really we did concentrate on the northern half of the World Heritage Site. And then in terms of chronology, um, we had to try and define what we were looking at. And kind of, not many people know that the World Heritage Site is actually inscribed for a particular time period. So it's inscribed for the period 3700 to 1600 BC. So basically the Neolithic and the Early Bronze Age. And that's really the core. That's why it is a World Heritage Site. That's its OUV, its outstanding value, is, is the Neolithic and Bronze Age monument. So really, that's what we concentrated on. And Unfortunately, things like Vespasian's camp, interesting as they are, do not get mentioned in the exhibition. Because you just have to kind of draw a boundary somewhere, otherwise you'd be there forever, you'd be writing a book. So, um, one of the things we did with the expert panel early on was come up with a basic timeline. Um, and really this is, this is the time period that I was talking about, <coughs> and we basically divided it into three, as you might expect kind of the early middle Neolithic, the late Neolithic and the early Bronze Age. Seems quite straightforward, but it's quite a major step in us trying to define how we we're going to present um, the stories in the exhibition. And we named these periods before Stonehenge, the time of Stonehenge and after Stonehenge was built, just to try and give people a sense of the chronology so that they might be able to learn that the cursus comes before, but the barrows come afterwards. Um, and, and give that basic sense of the chronology of what was going on in the landscape. So again, don't, don't worry, you don't need to read it. It's just that those three periods were kind of <clears throat> fairly crucial to define at the beginning. There's a, there's a massive timeline which sits behind this, which has got loads more detail in it, but this is, this is the top level. Um, and then despite the fact that there'd been masses and masses of research going on by lots of different university uh, projects, uh, we had some obvious gaps in our own knowledge when it came to deciding what to go in the exhibition. Um, firstly, we needed um, a database of all the archaeological objects from the World Heritage Site. Um, that's the image there of some uh, lovely uh, collodern and great cup from uh, Normanton Down. Um, so what condition were the objects in? Could we display them? Would anybody lend them to us? Quite a major point. Are you going to have objects on display or not? You can have entire museums without any objects on display. If anyone's been to Bannockburn, you'll know. Um, <laughs> And secondly, we needed a, a, another database, which is where were all the human remains? What museums held them? What condition were they in? Were they gonna help tell the story or do we want to display them or not? That's another major debate. Um, and we didn't have a decent 3D model of Stonehenge. We didn't have a, a recent survey. Um, and so part of the project was this, um, basically tied in with colleagues who are now sit within Historic England to do a massive landscape project. So this involved um, survey, detailed earthwork survey of all of the major monuments and barrier cemeteries in the World Heritage Site and a topographic earthwork survey of Stonehenge, as well as a laser scan of Stonehenge itself, which we did in 2011. Um, so this was all kind of collecting data and collecting evidence, collecting research that we could draw on. Um, and the laser survey we then got, um, after a bit of persuasion, analysed properly so that we could discover things about it rather than just having the 3D model. Uh, and that work was done by Marcus Abbott and Hugo anderson Weimark, And that was brilliant because we discovered a huge number of more carvings, lots and lots of information about how the stones were worked and shaped, and lots of information about how different parts of the, of the monument were shaped and worked in different ways. So that was really crucial information that we had. And lastly, I kind of ran a small project called the Landscape and Economy Project, which was basically asking lots of my colleagues, um, scientific colleagues, um, to kind of come up with questions, uh, or answers to questions I was asking, but there weren't really any answers to. So things like, what does a Neolithic pig look like, please? And, you know, you talk to animal bone specialists and they can tell you, oh, maybe it was this high, yeah, but what colour was it? And was it hairy? And, you know, basically all this information that we needed for our reconstructions and for information wasn't really easily accessible. So. I tried to get a number of different specialists to write reports for me on, on various different aspects about vegetation, animals, landscape, um, and working out kind of what we could show in our reconstruction and what we could talk about. Um, 
So the question of objects was one we had to deal with fairly early on. Um, English Heritage doesn't own any collections related to Stonehenge. All of the objects from Stonehenge, from the 1920s excavations, from the 1950s, 60s excavations, all went to local museums because um, at the time there wasn't anywhere at Stonehenge for them to be stored. Alexander Keeler's museum, which he did actually draw little pictures of, uh, never got built. So there was, there was nowhere to put these objects. Um, and most of them all went to Salisbury Museum. Uh, and Wiltshire Museum and Devizes had all of the antiquarian objects. If anyone's been, that you know they have fantastic early Bronze Age collections. So um, what we did early on is start talking to the two museums about how we could borrow basically their best Stonehenge related objects and stick them in our um, as yet unbuilt visitor center. And the way we did that was basically by, to give both museums quite large pots of money um, and for those museums to use that money to, to, to basically put in their own HLF bids. So both museums put together um, plans to redevelop their own prehistoric galleries and both of them put in major HLF bids and they were successful. And um, Salisbury opened their new galleries, their new Wessex gallery in July 2014 and Wiltshire beat us. They actually opened theirs in October 2013 before so the three venues basically try to work together to tell three parts of the same story. So we all have objects related to the Stonehenge landscape, but we all tell slightly different angles. Um, obviously, Wiltshire Museum concentrate very much on the antiquarian and the early Bronze Age story. Salisbury do much more about the archaeologists themselves and a kind of wider Wessex story, the landscape story, whereas we concentrate very much on the monuments themselves and the kind of immediate history of Stonehenge. <coughs> so I think that's kind of what, I mean, if anyone's been to both Salisbury and Wiltshire since they've done their new galleries, they are really great. They're very different to each other, um, but they're brilliant. And it's great that the two local museums have been able to kind of capitalise on that. And one of the things we've tried to do is market those two museums to our visitors. Because we get over a million visitors a year, and these two museums would like to see some of those visitors. So it's about kind of marketing a kind of Wiltshire holiday or a Wiltshire visit or a day trip where you go to Stonehenge and then to Salisbury or whatever. So that's an ongoing thing, and it's it's not easy to do, but we're trying. Um, this is um, just, again, slightly boring, sorry, but it's what we call a theme table, and it's basically a way of capturing all of the things that you want to put in your exhibition. Um, and it was a, a process of a lot of meetings, as you can imagine. But basically, we came up with five themes under which we could kind of group all the things we wanted to talk about. Sky stones, landscape people meeting. And you'll see that these kind of themes um, are, were eventually reflected in the layout of the exhibition. Don't worry about reading it, it's not important. But those were the kind of five areas that we, we could basically kind of corral all of our questions and information into. Um, and that's a theme table's um, slightly gone out of fashion in interpretive circles now. You kind of do more on learning outcomes and what you want people to go away coming out with. But actually, at the time, this was the way you did things. And, Actually, I prefer doing theme tables like this because you can basically just do a massive kind of brainstorm and stick everything in in a big discussion meeting and then usually something falls out of it that works. Um, as I said, one of the things that was being debated at the time we were trying to uh, write the exhibition was the chronology of Stonehenge itself. So um, the antiquity paper, which was written by uh, Mike Parker Pearson and Tim Darvel and co, came out in 2012. So literally just at the point where we were kind of going, right, we need to commission the models, we need to do the, the text. Um, and what we had to do is basically take an early draft of that paper and simplify it massively and use that for our own um, interpretation. And we um, used the laser scan and the model from the laser scan to kind of make our models. So we basically, um, these just show the models that we gave to our actual 3D model maker um, to, to kind of get across those three um, periods. They're not massively different from the kind of classic three period the kind of um, chronology of Stonehenge that we all kind of know, but there are some subtle differences. And one of the things we never really resolved was, are there stones or are there wooden posts in the Aubrey holes? And basically, they should be able to be interpreted as either, although they look a little bit more stone-like. Um, <laughs> so um, that, that was one of the things we never really got our heads from, because you know nobody agrees and we just don't know until we excavate another Aubrey hole, we really haven't got enough evidence to say. Um, so this was uh, phase one, kind of 3000 BC, the early enclosure um, and the uprights in the Aubrey Holes. Of course, at the time, Stonehenge is a major cremation cemetery being used for an estimated 150 burials. Uh, 
Then in 2500 BC, you have the Sarsens and the Bluestones going up at the same time. That was quite a crucial difference in the chronology that come before. And then uh, the Bluestones get rearranged and a number of various other things happen and the avenue gets constructed. So that was our kind of basic chronology. And that, that was a lot of work, just deciphering <coughs> draft versions of the antiquity paper and trying to get that through uh, to our model makers. So at this point, really, we were looking at um, trying to actually design the exhibition. So what colours are we going to use? How is it going to be laid out? What fonts? Uh, what kind of visual style do we want? And obviously, we work closely with our exhibition designers, Hayley Sharp, on, on all aspects of this. Um, some of our ideas, some of our initial discussions never saw the light of day. It would have been lovely to do them, but we, you know, they're kind of slightly wacky ideas. Um, so um, this was really, this is the kind of document that comes out of these discussions about colours, look and feel, all those kind of things. Um, and particularly the object cases were a huge amount of work. If you can imagine designing an object case that you can walk around all four sides of in 3D on paper, and trying to imagine how that works. I can't tell you how many pieces of paper we had and lists of objects before we got that right. It took a very long time. Um, one of the key things we did was choose colors for those three main periods that I talked about when we had the timeline. Basically, we just assigned a color to each of those um, three periods. And when those periods were being talked about, either in the exhibition or in the guidebook or out in the landscape on panels, we just used these, these colors as part of the design scheme. It's subtle, I don't think any visitors actually notice, but it's there and it should help you kind of orientate um, yourself. Oh, actually, I'll just make a point. You might notice that there it says after Stonehenge. For a long time, we called it before Stonehenge, the time of Stonehenge and after Stonehenge. And I was never quite happy with after Stonehenge because there isn't really an after Stonehenge. It doesn't disappear. Uh, obviously, all the Bronze Age barrow cemeteries are there because of Stonehenge. Um, so that's why we adjusted it subtly to after the time of Stonehenge, which is a, a little bit odd, but it, yeah, it never quite sat as well as it should have done, but we could have just stuck with kind of Neolithic and Early Bronze Age, but we wanted something a little bit simpler. And the text in the exhibition does talk about the Neolithic and the Bronze Age, it's just a kind of upper level that doesn't. Um, so one of the um, things we decided actually quite easily was the visual style that we wanted to get across in the exhibition. Um, we wanted to go for a photorealistic um, approach. Quite a lot of prehistoric reconstructions do that kind of classic watercolour, wishy-washy, let's hide everything behind smoke because we're not quite sure what's going on in the background. Um, and we <laughs> wanted to get away from that, um, partly because expectations of visitors are so much higher than they used to be. People play Skyrim, people watch Game of Thrones, they know that this stuff can be done and they expect to see it. And if you give them a wishy-washy watercolour, it doesn't really do it. <laughs> well, that's our opinion anyway. Um, but one of the crucial things was trying to get a style that could be united across different um, media and different artists. So the top two um, pictures are um, reconstructions done by Peter Lorimer, who we commissioned to do a total of 10 reconstructions showing all kinds of different periods and different monuments. Um, they're just static 2D reconstructions, but he works completely digitally. Um, actually, that was uh, quite difficult because he was very, very slow. We had to work very, very hard to get those delivered in time. And then based on that, based on his style, we asked all of our filmmakers to kind of match his style. So the middle strip is from the 360 film, introductory film. So that was done by one company. Uh, and then this one at the bottom was done by a different AV company. So again, matching Peter's style. And the uh, cutaway image of the Neolithic House, sorry if you can't see at the back, um, but um, that's, again, a different artist, Drew Smith, but we asked him to try and match Peter's style. So supposedly, if you're a visitor, you don't really know that all these different people have worked on, on this, and it's a kind of coherent style. The difficult thing with choosing photorealistic type reconstructions is that it puts more pressure on the person deciding what things look like, because you can't hide behind smoke or just make it a bit fuzzy. You have to actually decide, okay, what are the people wearing? What exactly do the cows look like? what the houses look like, what are we going to show, you know, it's really detailed. If you zoom into these pictures, there's lots of detail. And so you have to be really specific about briefing your reconstruction artist and knowing the stuff well enough to be able to say all of these things. So, so that was kind of, we had a bit moment of doubt about whether we could do this, but we did do it and I think it, I think it worked okay. Um, and the other thing we had to think about was visitor flow. Uh, Stonehenge is 
I think we get about 1.2 million visitors a year at the moment. And most of those, those visitors, about half, are coming on kind of coach tours. And they've been to Windsor Castle in the morning and they're at Stonehenge and they're going to Bath in the afternoon. And that's their day. And they really don't want to spend that much time at Stonehenge. So, and then there are other visitors who want to spend all day there and go for a walk in the landscape and look at everything in detail. And so we basically have the way that it's designed standard interpretive practice is a hierarchy, is a level system. So the purple arrow are people who are literally, I'm going to Stonehenge, I'm going to have my selfie and I'm going to go home again. <laughs> Uh, or I'm going to Bath, or wherever my next coach tour stop is. So they don't even go in the exhibition. So you've got to cater for those people who are possibly getting their information from somewhere else, like the audio tour. Then you've got the yellow arrows, which are people who are kind of interested, like they'll go in the exhibition, but they've got a four-year-old who really doesn't want to be in an exhibition, or they are kind of pressed for time, or they're thinking maybe we should get lunch, actually, rather than standing here. So they're, they're kind of going to see the main messages. They might watch a bit of film and then move on. They might wander around, but you know they're not going to kind of engage with every single word of text. Then you've got the blue people, the blue arrows, and they're much more engaged. They're going to go and look at the cases and look at the objects and read quite a lot of text. Nobody reads all text. Everybody knows that. I don't read all text. Nobody reads all. You don't read all text. If you go to a museum, not everyone reads all text. They just don't. And then finally, you've got the green arrows who are really engaged. They've actually even gone into our temporary exhibition space, which I'll talk about in a minute. And they, that arrow there represents them actually engaging with events or something, a demonstration perhaps that's going on. So they're, they're really there and they're getting the most out of their visit. So all of the information is based on this layered hierarchical level system. Um, and everything that you do is fit, slot, slots into one of those, those levels. Um, so this is the layout of the exhibition. Um, you come in here. Uh, apologies for those people who have been, um, but most of you haven't. So I don't think I'll be boring too many of you. You come in here, this is your kind of decompression space, your lobby where you show your tickets. And you come into this space, which is a 360 degree film. This is our introductory film, lasts for three minutes. <coughs> you can come into it any time. It's designed to be started. There's no start and end, it just, it just loops the whole time. Um, and it shows you the monument through time and through different seasons and different weathers. Um, and you come out and there's some key kind of message totems here, which basically give a few key messages. The people is sort of delivered, our people theme, if you remember that theme table that had those themes, and our people are delivered through the object cases. We've got landscape wall at the top there, which is another film. What you can't see is just in here on this wall is some models, which again do the kind of stone story. And then we've got a meaning section where we've got films about different interpretations and different theories and meanings of Stonehenge. And then we've got a temporary exhibition space, which was really because this is a fairly small space, and there are so many stories about Stonehenge that you could tell that we just couldn't fit them all in. So the idea is that the temporary exhibition space can be used for all those different um, stories that are not in the permanent display and can be used for, for example, presenting the results of new research that happen in the area to the public in the future. Um, so um, I haven't got this film because basically if you watch, this is one screen, it's a 360 degree film and if you actually watch it, it's like looking at a post box. It's tiny across the screen. So I spent a lot of my time looking at this post box sized kind of bit of film. But anyway, this is a, this is a, a still from it when it wasn't quite complete. Uh, you might notice the blue stones are looking a bit gray. Um, but basically this film um, was produced for us by a company called Center Screen in Manchester. And the CGI was done by um, a company called Sue Liddell, who are Basically, they do kids' TV most of the time. They do Rory the Racing Car and other such uh, programs. And uh, they did all the CGI, but based on the laser scanning data. So the laser um, scan data was used to create these models. We had to slightly cheat. So basically, the tallest um, child thumb, half which is missing in this view, uh, was basically slightly too tall for our screen to do it entirely to scale. So we just slightly shrunk that. But other than that, it's, it's, it's all to scale, and it's supposed to be that if you're standing in the middle of Stonehenge and you see it just changing through time. Um, and you see a, uh, a winter solstice and a summer solstice. Uh, and it, all, it, it doesn't have a narrative, it has a soundtrack, uh, but it's supposed to give you that overview um, of the three different periods and the changes that have happened to Stonehenge and why it looks the way it does today. Um, these are our some of our key sort of message totems. These were just kind of messages that we came up with that we would quite like people to remember and go away with. Um, 
there were some underlying messages that we didn't actually write down anywhere. The one, one about the mystery and the theories, as in we do actually know quite a lot, that was one of the underlying messages. And the other is sort of there in that it was basically trying to get across the fact that prehistoric people are not kind of other cavemen, that these are sophisticated, well-adapted, very experienced, cultural, amazing people who did completely mad things that we cannot understand and cannot do ourselves. So it was just trying to get across the fact that, you know, not only are these people building Stonehenge, but they have a whole cultural kind of life that you haven't necessarily thought about before. So they, those are our kind of underlying, well, for me, they were the underlying messages. Um, our object cases, we had five object cases, um, and three of them dealt with the time of Stonehenge, one with the period before and one with the period afterwards. Um, and we selected our lovely objects from the museums. Um, it's really difficult to design these, as I said, they're three, you can walk all the way around one of these cases, and to design them in 3D is actually quite difficult, but, but the way we decided to do it was by questions. So literally, this one here says, how was Stonehenge built? And they're basic questions that came out from our visitor surveys that people wanted to know. So who built Stonehenge? How was it built? What was it used for? Where were people living? You know, they're really easy ways in. And even if actually if English is your second language, you can start to begin to read the text and work out what that case is about. One of the um, design decisions was made completely by accident in that our photographer, James Davis, went and photographed our objects and put them on this lovely black perspex which reflected the objects and made them look lovely. And that was, we actually used black perspex in the cases in the end, because we decided that that was a nice way of displaying them. But when we first gave our object list to our designers, uh, they basically went, oh, they're all like a bit brown and small. <laughs> <laughs> and we had to go like, these are the most amazing objects ever. Um, but in truth, they are all a bit brown and small. Um, even lovely things like this necklace, which is from one of the Normanton Down barrows, okay, it's kind of small. And, you know, to make all these objects look fantastic was a real task for our designers. But I think by the end, we'd convinced them that they were special enough. But yeah, to designers, this is not the stuff they normally like to work with. Um, there's not much to go on. So quite a lot of work went into getting the 3D designs correct. Um, oh, I'll just point out where that sits. Um, on each of the cases, there's a little apron, like a little flat area. And it has um, tactile objects and a little film. And the films, each of the five films were, again, created by a different AV company. Uh, um, can't remember their names. That's really bad. They've slipped my mind. They're in Scotland. Um, and basically mixed live action and cartoons. So we wanted to take an object from that case and show how it was made, in effect. So that involved doing things like filming Phil, uh, filming people like Neil Burridge making a, a bronze axe. Um, and then interspersing that with, with um, so basically cartoons showing those processes happening in a, in a larger scale. So we mixed the two together. And that basically meant we could film without getting anything modern in shot, but then zoom out to, to basically show things that we could, you know, without a film production budget, we couldn't have ever done. And it, there are things like I specifically put the Sarsen workers as female because I just wanted to try and mess up people's heads a little bit. No, no I just wanted to try and uh, get across the fact that it's not always men, you know, it's not always people, men working on the site and we, potentially it could have been women. And actually the person who did all the Sarsen working for us was Katie Whitaker, who um, had done our masters in Sarsen um, working and it was her hands that were used. So they were female hands that were used in the small shots and then we zoomed out and showed women working with stones uh, on the large shots as well. Um, Human remains. Okay, this is probably the most controversial bit about our exhibition. Uh, I guess we didn't probably think of it at the time as being that controversial, but we did know it was going to be an issue. Um, we didn't deliberately set out with the aim of including human remains, um, but we did have the express aim of telling the story of the people of the Stonehenge landscape. And because the vast majority of what is going on in that Stonehenge landscape has something to do with funerary activities, whether you're talking about the cremation period um, at the early phases of Stonehenge, whether you're talking about beaker burials in the landscape, or whether you're talking about early Neolithic long barrows, there's a lot of um, human remains in that landscape. And they're some of our best evidence for what we know about the people. So to kind of miss out this from the exhibition for some kind of worry about putting them on display, to us felt completely disingenuous. Um, so our exhibition cases were split into different periods, and what we decided to do was select one burial from each of those three periods. 
Um, so this one here is our early Neolithic um, burial from Winterbourne Stoke Longbarrow. This one is a big burial from the Wilsford um, Cemetery, not far from Stonehenge. We also haven't got a picture of it. We also had a cremation from Stonehenge. And um, this one was a real surprise, actually. We, we knew that there hadn't been any modern excavations of long barrows in the Stonehenge landscape, but we did know there'd been antiquarian excavations, and particularly John Thurnham in the 1860s had excavated a huge number of long barrows um, in the area and had kept the skulls because he was interested in skulls and shapes of heads at the time. And they were all in the Duckworth um, collection uh, in Cambridge, uh, in something that's now called the Lieberhulm Centre for Human, and Human Evolutionary Studies. Um, and so we went to Cambridge to have a look at the skulls to see what condition they were in and where they were from. And we were kind of in a basement looking at lots of skulls going, well, it's a bit weird to just have a skull on display, but this is all we've got. This is the only early Neolithic human remains. And they went, oh, actually, there's another box here. Oh, look, there's an entire skeleton from Winterbourne Stoke. <laughs> uh, so nobody knew that, that, that he had been um, preserved. Why Thurnham chose to preserve him, I don't know. I think he was a particularly well-preserved example. And he has been hung up at some stage. He's got um, um, holes in him for wire to be hung in some sort of laboratory or anatomy room. Um, so presumably he just decided to keep one. Um, but that's very unusual. And he's basically the only known early Neolithic burial uh, from the Stonehenge landscape, unless we excavate another one. And once we discovered that we had him, and that the Duckworth collection did have both his skull and his, uh, the rest of his body, <laughs> Took a bit of doing. Um, we basically set out on a whole load of research. So we did uh, some uranium carbon dating. We did um, isotope analysis. Uh, Simon Mays, our skeletal um, um, expert, looked at all the bones, and we commissioned uh, ooh, a picture of it. this um, reconstructed um, facial reconstruction, which was done by an artist called Oscar Nielsen, who's Swedish, and uh, he's brilliant. I love him. He's great. Uh, Os Oscar was. He thought this was the best facial reconstruction he'd ever done. So we were really pleased with it. And it was part of that trying to bring the people of the Stonehenge area to life. And it I mean, ended up being used quite a lot in press releases and things around the time of the opening of the exhibition. But um, in a way, he wasn't like somebody who was actually involved in building or using Stonehenge, but um, it, he was the most photogenic bits of the exhibition, I think. <laughs> <laughs> some, people, some people, everyone goes in and goes, oh, he looks like my dad or my brother or something. Or, <laughs> a lot of people seem to think he looks like famous people anyway. He doesn't look like anyone in particular. He looks like Mr. Winterbourne Stoke. We did call him Mr. Winterbourne Stoke quite a lot through the process. Um, and then um, so we did. We couldn't do facial reconstruction for this big bear because his, uh, the skull was too fragmented. But basically, this was a... Um, a beaker barrel that had been excavated in 2001 by Wessex Archaeology as part of the uh, an earlier A303 evaluation <coughs> project. And um, we had very good modern records of exactly how he was found and where the pieces of beaker pottery were and the animal bones and a belt ring. And so we could basically lay him out exactly as found as a burial. With Mr. Winterbourne Stoke, we didn't have a clue because Thurnham didn't really record anything about how he was found. So we, we displayed him upright. Um, Obviously, the display of human remains caused quite a lot of controversy. Um, we uh, were quite adamant that we made the right decision, but it's quite hard to stand up in front of a room full of druids and pagans and make that statement, as I had to do. Probably one of the low points of the project for me. Um, justifying why we were putting their ancestors on display was kind of one of the hardest things I've had to do. And it was really, really difficult. And relations with them probably have not been as good since. Um, but I, I think we felt very strongly that we needed to make a bold statement about putting human remains on display. And since we opened Salisbury Museum, it also put human remains on display in their galleries. And I think uh, we tried to do it with as much respect and as much thinking about it and as much thought as possible. But as I said, to leave them out would have been very odd, I think. Um, so um, finally, I just wanted to talk about the rest of the um, elements, the temp oh, the, um, the models, which are here, showing the phases. This is, this is a snapshot. This is about an hour before it opens to the public. And this <laughs> is Sarah, who was the curator, and James Davis, who's a photographer, literally dusting, because they thought that it, was going to, it needed to look perfect for its opening, um, opening hour. Um, this was the landscape film. This is just a still from it. But again, 
it's a it's a change of film shows the landscapes through all different um, the three different periods that we're talking about. Um, I actually got this film, so if anyone after the talk wants to watch it, I've got it with me. Uh, we had a timeline, which was a kind of basic thing, particularly for our international visitors. You know, how old is Stonehenge compared to the pyramids or uh, Easter Island statues or Karnak? Things like that. So that was kind of trying to put it into a bit of a time context. Um, these are our meaning films. So the meaning display area was done by films, partly because we wanted to make sure that if somebody comes up with a brand new theory in a couple of years' time, all we have to do is commission a new film and stick that in there. It's kind of one of those things that can be updated if we want to. But we focus on two historic theories. Uh, William Stukeley's ideas about it being a Druid temple. Uh, Gerald Hawkins talking about it being an astronomical computer. Um, Two current theories, or whether they're still current, you could argue, Mike Parker Pearson's um, sort of stone versus wood, Stonehenge for the ancestors theory, and Tim Darville's healing bluestones ideas. And then finally, a film which talks about the meaning of Stonehenge for people today. So as a kind of heritage icon, as a spiritual place, as an inspiration for art, all those kind of things. Our temporary exhibition space, um, we've had three exhibitions in there so far. The first one was about um, how various people have decided who built Stonehenge, so it was kind of like an antiquarian one. This was the opening one, it was called Set in Stone, How Our Ancestors Have Seen Stonehenge, which is a rubbish title, but anyway, it was quite a good exhibition and we borrowed things. We had the three man medieval manuscripts that show Stonehenge on display, the originals, and to actually get the British Library and Corpus Christi College in Cambridge to lend us those three medieval manuscripts when we hadn't actually built the visitor centre and we didn't have any environmental data mm. from any cases was, oh, I can't believe we managed to do it, it was such an mm. amazing thing. And to have the, those three medieval manuscripts on display together for the first time, no one, I didn't think anyone else was as excited about it, but I was excited <laughs> about it. Um, and lots of other things like we had Aubrey's, um, John Aubrey's original manuscripts from the Bodleian on display um, and things like that. So it was sort of a history of how people have um, thought about Stonehenge. That was our opening one. We've since done one on World War I to coincide with um, 2014, 1914, which was about soldiers at Stonehenge. So it's about the basic start of World War I and what that meant for the soldiers who claimed Stonehenge area. And currently we have in there um, Julian Richards' uh, exhibition, which is basically called Wish You Were Here, and it's all about uh, Stonehenge tat, in fact. It's souvenirs, <laughs> guidebooks, Stonehenge-inspired things. It's lovely. It's really colourful. Visitors love it. So we've got that in there currently. And we're now working on the next two different exhibitions which are going to go in um, next year. So it's an, that's an ongoing and massive commitment to keep going with temporary exhibitions. In the future, we'd like to do things like art, get the Turner, get the Constable. We'd like to have some more of the archaeological collections. Um, we might do one, say, on the Stonehenge Riverside Project results, maybe to coincide with the publication of one of their monographs. That'd be quite nice to kind of give people a sense of new ideas and new research and things happening. So that's that space. And of course, we've got outdoors to the visitor centre as well. So we have a map which helps people try and explore the landscape. We have um, an interactive sarsen stone. You may <laughs> recognise the people pulling the sarsen stone. Um, but uh, that's, to kind of, that's to try and give a sense of scale of the stones and also a bit of information about how they might have been moved. Um, we have our Neolithic houses. Uh, reconstructed um, Neolithic houses based on the ones excavated at Durrington Walls. I could have done you an entire hour just on the Neolithic Houses project, which I also ran and researched and did, um, which was a major, major project, um, particularly commissioning all of the replica objects, getting everything fitted out. Um, but they're real, they, they were always designed to be there from the start. They're a kind of antidote to the exhibition. So the exhibition is not very hands-on and quite kind of watch and read, whereas the Neolithic houses are very much touch, feel, smell, you know, immerse yourself. The idea is to try and get across a sense of Neolithic life at the time of Stonehenge and also make that link to the settlement at Durrington Walls. Um, where, how people, uh, people generally like this, particularly um, our overseas visitors, because it's immediate, they understand exactly what it is before they even get in a house. If, you're, if, if you haven't got English, there are ways of um, listening to bits of the exhibition on an audio tour, but there isn't a complete set of the exhibition in, say, German. But the, but the Neolithic houses are a bit more immediate. Um, of course, uh, elements down at the monument end. This is a kind of, this background picture, I think we're not supposed to really use it anymore, but basically this is a kind of visualisation of what it would look like when we've taken away the work road. 
Um, it doesn't quite look like that yet, but fingers crossed when the grass finishes growing on the road and we actually take the fence, some of the more fences away, it will look more like that. Um, so we did a new audio tour. The, the existing audio tour was something like an hour, over an hour long, if you listen to every single stop, which is completely mad. So we made a much shorter, more punchy audio tour and a family guide. Um, and quite a number of panels out in the landscape. So we did 14, I think, interpretive panels with the National Trust out in the landscape. And we installed some new markers, the Mesolithic post holes in the car park, which used to be marked by white concrete discs, have now got these nice wooden markers. And we put in a solstice arrow to try and give people a sense of where the solstice alignment was. That's on the old roadbed. We haven't just dug up fresh archaeology to put that in, but it basically shows you the, the alignment. And finally, a lot of web material and some publications, new guidebook, a new map, uh, the Stonehenge Navy map, walking map, which has Stonehenge on one side and Navy on the other, and a book which was to accompany uh, the first exhibition, which at the last minute our chief executive decided we needed the catalogue. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I guess really to sum up, this is a, these are some pictures from when the visitor centre was being built. I guess it was probably not until I saw this stage I was actually realising it was going to happen. <laughs> and you can see all of the wires going in for all of the lighting and the AV. Um, so I guess the visitor centre has now been open for two years. I can't quite believe it's been two years already. Um, and looking back, I thought I'd kind of pick out my kind of high points and my low points. Um, I can't believe we managed to do it, really. I'm looking at it, and I go and visit now, and it's sort of bedded in, and there's grass growing, and there's visitors, and they're going in, and they're sitting inside a nice warm cafe with a cup of tea, and they're wandering around an exhibition, and then they go, and it just is so different to what was there before. It, it is, it's a major achievement to have done the project. Um, but there was a huge amount of work, and it didn't always go smoothly. Um, but mostly we've had, I would say, nothing but positive feedback from people going and visiting the exhibition and the evaluation that we've done of what people have learned, people are coming out saying those key messages that we wanted them to, to learn, so that's really good. Um, I guess the low points for me were, there was a point in 2010 when I was on site in that really horrible small staff room talking to the current site staff about what we were going to do in the project and I had a phone call from my boss's boss telling me that the Tories had just removed our £10 million of funding and the project would therefore not be going ahead. And I had to sit there and come back into the room and tell the staff that, no, it wasn't going to go ahead after all. Um, but actually, we did. We just had to stand down from the project for an entire year while we fundraised the rest. That Basically, we had to fundraise that £10 million instead of having it from the government. So uh, we basically upped our HLF bid from £5 million to £10 million, and then we fundraised the rest of that £5 million from uh, the Wolfson Foundation and various other smaller charitable foundations. So we did manage to do it, but it was not with the government's help. And that's why the Visitor Centre didn't open for the Olympics. That was the original plan, was that the Visitor Centre would be there for the 2012 Olympics. It wasn't because we had to stand down for a year for that funding raising to happen. That was probably that and the Druid meeting. Those were my low points. <laughs> um, and I guess, yeah, as I said, the high points are really now seeing the Visitor Centre open, seeing uh, people enjoying themselves, seeing the staff actually have an exhibition to man and talk to people about. Um, and, and kind of seeing particularly people's reactions to the exhibition and to the Neolithic houses uh, is really special. <coughs> and, and explaining to people that, yes, this is the Heelstone, and there once was a road just here. People can't believe it. They say, well, there's a road there. Yes, there was, even new members of staff have to explain that there was a road there, because it's, we can't see it anymore. And really, again, people just walking in that landscape, we've managed, I think, because the visitor centre has moved away and we've encouraged people to walk in the landscape, a lot of people do now walk between the visitor centre and Stonehenge. So they see barrows and they see the cursus and they get a sense of the landscape. And that's really important because people aren't just doing that half an hour visit, whizzing around the stones and going off again. They're hopefully getting a sense of the landscape and the time of prehistory that we're talking about. So that's it. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs> heritage interpretation work or who are training as professionals in heritage interpretation that kind of information is gold <laughs> and learning everything about how you're using colors to the messages to the economics behind it it's really really spectacular 
answers. So thank you. And I'm sure, like me, there are many questions uh, in the audience. So um, we have time for a few. Uh, there's a couple of hands. We'll start at the very back with Jamie and then move forward. Thanks very much. Yeah, that was really, really compelling. Um, I work on, with, with uh, rock art. And I, Maybe there's some similarities in that people have always got an opinion on why this was created in the first place. Something that's so well known as Stonehenge or so accessible. And it's something that I have to deal with, especially when it comes to ideas of meaning. Um, I, I'm interested in at what point in the development did you decide to keep meaning separate from the other four sky, stones, landscape, and, and people? And was there a danger that there was this implication that those first four are sort of neutral? Theory free ideas that will always stand. And you mentioned about how you obviously have to pick five theories and yeah. you can't put them all there. But this danger of um, hyper relativism are all interpretations as valid as, as each other. Aliens aren't mentioned. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, although Spinal Tap is mentioned. And, uh, I, snuck it, I did sneak in a Spinal Tap quote. Uh, yeah, um, it's a really good question. Uh, it was a fairly early on process. Um, I'm not saying that the text and the images in the rest of the exhibition don't have any sense of unknown to them. You know, there are bits where it says, we don't know, whatever, whatever. But it's that sense of having particular theories about Stonehenge. There was a debate very early on, I think one of the first meetings I went to, it was kind of, are you going to present Mike Parker Pearson's theory as the interpretation? And I was like, no, of course we're not going to. That's a theory. That That's current at the moment and it's fashionable and it's exciting but in 10 years time we will probably have something different so it was that it was that element really of, of, of knowing that we didn't want to present a particular theory and therefore having to separate them off slightly um i guess our approach is more that sense of we like to get away from the sense that it's all mysterious rather than we want to separate off theory from everything else because you know, as we all know, the two are not separable. But for a visitor, it's useful to have that definition, I think, and to know that if Mike Parker Pearson starts talking about ancestors, that it isn't necessarily given from the evidence, if you mean, that that's an interpretation or a theory. So, yeah, I, I think it's a really interesting debate. And, um, and there are lots and lots of things that we wanted to do but couldn't. So, for example, in that meaning bit, we wanted to have a bit where you maybe voted or gave your own opinion or had some sort of interaction with what you thought. But the technology and the amount of visitors and just making sure that actually worked was quite tricky. And, and it would be nice to do that. And equally, there was an idea that we would have some more interactive elements to the exhibition, which were pulled because people were worried about dwell time and worried about their space becoming too full and cramped. Actually, I think those worries were unfounded because quite a lot of our visitors don't go in the exhibition. And we could probably put something like that back in to the scheme in a kind of review of it. Um, but yeah, so um, I, I don't know if I've answered your question really, sorry. Um, but I, yeah, it's, it is interesting. And um, I wouldn't like to think that we've kind of presented fact and theory, but we have tried to separate off the theories in a sense. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, in the yeah, with a water bottle. <laughs> um, I'm curious what has English Heritage taken from this project going forward or, or currently are using on new That's a really interesting question. Okay, so it's such a big project that basically almost all the people who worked on it no longer work for English Heritage because it either <laughs> literally <laughs> killed them. I'm not I'm not joking, some of them have died, or they've retired. <laughs> Or they've gone, that was just the nightmare of my life. I need to go do something different. So I would say that actually that's probably something that we fail at is learning from our projects. We do evaluation. We kind of take on board what the visitors think and whether we've delivered our objectives and things. And all of the people who work on interpretive projects, English Heritage, have visited Stonehenge and seen what we've done and, and worked with similar designers and, and uh, filmmakers. And, you know, I'm sure everyone takes inspiration. But actually, Stonehenge is kind of not that much like many other of our properties in that we have a purpose-built modern visitor centre and it's about prehistory. Most of our other properties, you know, you might be interpreting castles, abbeys, those sort of sites a bit more. So, um, and I'm sure that our, my interpretive colleagues take inspiration, maybe a bit from Stonehenge, what we did at Stonehenge, but from a whole raft of other projects that people are doing. 
in the National Trust, in historic royal palaces, in you know, in other similar resources in, in some similar worlds. Um, I guess um, there has been, it's the biggest project we'll ever deliver. And if we ever have to deliver another project, we will learn a huge amount of lessons about how you structure projects like that and how you deal with external people. We, we are kind of, I guess, naive clients to say the architects. So the architects, here's your building, we go, oh, lovely. And here's your doors, I'm like great doors, yep, we need doors. But actually, <laughs> the doors are a real pain because the doors work on a mechanism which is automatic and they're really heavy and people get confused about whether they open or close. Actually, someone should have said, I need to see those doors in situation somewhere on another site to make sure that they're okay. But because we were such a small team, no one had the time to go and check that the doors would open and close properly because you kind of see that that's going to happen. If we were like a clever client, like say, a big corporation or a big com commercial company, we'd have, we'd have checked every single one of those details. And because of that, um, I think we, we probably could have made improvements to things like doors and toilets and stuff. Um, the other thing that I think we probably should not have done, and which I hope we would learn from in any other major project, is that we had the old visitor centre open until December the 17th as a normal opening operation with staff and visitors. The next morning, we opened the new one. That was completely mad. Why? I mean, just I mean, that was basically because we couldn't afford to lose any income. But it basically meant the staff hadn't even been in the building. They hadn't had training on the tills. They didn't know how to unlock all the doors. Yeah, that that was the most stressful thing to do. And we did that on the 18th of December. Then the, the massive press coverage because we've opened a new visitor centre. And then the Christmas period was incredibly busy because everyone came to see the new visitor centre. And then we had problems because the tills didn't work. The visitor transit system didn't work. You know, there were lots of teething problems, which you would expect on any project. But then we got some bad press, press coverage because it wasn't quite ready. And really, what we should have done is gone, no, nope, we're shutting down over Christmas, so hinges shut, and just been a bit more bold about that. I think I think that was probably something. If we, I think most of our other major projects now, we were a little bit braver about making sure that we do it properly. <laughs> so the opening specifically, yes. And at what point did your exhibition designers come on board? Because it sounds very much that the interpretation was driven by yourselves uh, and the interpretation yeah. of the site. And I was just wondering if they, how much of a say they had or whether they guided you in terms of how that would work within those, what, as you said, yeah. quite ex small exhibition spaces. Yes, yeah, so Hayley Sharp were appointed in 2009, so very early on. And actually, I probably didn't give them enough credit that they came up with the idea of a 360 film. They came up with um, the layout as it as it is now. I mean, we didn't really change it from their ideas. Um, we did a lot of kind of like here's what objects we'd like, and they came back to it. But so it's it, it was quite a discursive process, really. The whole thing. But there were some early brainstorming meetings where we had lots of ideas about, particularly that 360, about virtual reality, about having headsets and 3D glasses, about having seating or whatever we stand. You know, all kinds of discussions about that sort of stuff. But actually, having a simple projected 360 film was much, much better because you didn't have to hand out handsets, headsets to people, you know, all those things. You have those mad ideas about all these amazing things you can do. And actually, when it comes to it, simpler is better. And the design team at Hayley Sharp really did do all of the thinking behind the layout and, and how we would do that kind of thing. And they also did a lot of the, all the graphics, the way the graphics looked was very much down to them. Um, how the films worked and the storyline and the content, that was all us. So I guess, yeah, it's sort of, I guess, group effort. yeah, a group effort, 50-50. Yeah. <laughs> and, and do you know how large uh, square meter-wise your exhibition spaces are? I should do, I should do, but I don't, I'm really sorry. I could tell you, I can start on my laptop and look at the plan. <laughs> but no, I'll, I'll email you. Yeah, yeah, do. <laughs> Yeah, um, how has working on this project changed your views and opinions and interpretation? If at all? Uh, I guess for, I mean, a massive learning curve, obviously. I went from producing panels on a site that would have a tiny number of visitors a year to the biggest prehistoric site in the country. You know, I mean, a huge learning curve for me, particularly learning how to work with designers, how to work with contractors how to work with people who are developing AV models, replicas, building Neolithic houses. You know, you've got a huge number of people out there who are kind of working on different elements. And that was a massive learning curve. Um, 
I think now I would probably be more I now work on, I'm working on Tintagel Castle at the moment, for example, you know, there are projects I'm now working on are kind of more medium sized projects. And I guess um, I'm more confident because I know what we can do. Um, but particularly the digital side of things, um, using laser scanning, using photogrammetry, you're getting that data. Uh, at this, uh, now at the uh, outset of any project, I'm just like, collect the data, let's do the surveys, mm -hmm. let's get the, because you're always going to be able to use it in some way. So at Tintagel, for example, we've just done a 3D model of the site, which basically has a projected film onto it, which is mapped onto the 3D model of the site and shows it changing through time. And that, I wouldn't have even come up with that idea if I hadn't done the Stonehenge project and done sort of similar ideas. So um, I guess the digital side of it was the most steep learning curve for me. Um, I also basically rediscovered my love of prehistory, hence why I'm now doing a PhD. So in a way, for me, that was getting back to what I'd done in my undergraduate days and really kind of knowing that prehistory is what excites me. <laughs> Obviously, Stonehenge is very iconic and is a very big target as well. So, um, over the years, uh, critiques such as uh, Barbara Bender's Stonehenge have been published. And I was kind of wondering, have you incorporated those um, critiques at all? And you touched a little bit upon um, the druids and whatnot. It's like what the most magical experience for me of Stonehenge, the only time I've visited was at winter solstice several years ago. Yeah when obviously the site is open. Do you plan on keeping it open for that? What other kind of things have you done to sort of address those audiences? I know that you kind of had that open day, but you decided to do the skeletal remains anyway. So can you talk a little bit more about yeah. those tensions? Okay, so um, just to address the first bit about kind of, you know, the, the kind of classic bender type criticism. I mean, those are those are papers and chapters that I read when I was an undergrad. Mm -hmm. And I re I actually have reread re some of them quite recently. And it's quite interesting to look at how critical they were. I mean, really critical. And it's very easy to stand outside and be an academic archaeologist and critique what a heritage organisation is doing. But on the inside of people just like me trying to do their best and actually the budgets and the constraints, you know, there's a whole load of things that you don't really understand if you're not if you're just sitting outside going, well, it'd be nice if they did this, you know, in a kind of academic way. So, um, yeah, that, that, I guess that'd be my response to that. I mean, that, but I think it is interesting to go back to those papers now. There's a there's a kind of underswell at the moment of kind of um, oh, we are trying to restore Stonehenge landscape back to a kind of a landscape that it's never been in a kind of like you're removing all of the modern features from around Stonehenge, but actually that's part of the history of the site. And there's a, there's a kind of interesting tension there now, particularly with the A3, A3 debates coming in about how are we like desanitize, are we kind of taking away from the site what it's, some of its history and, and that kind of thing. And I think the counter to that would be that things like our temporary exhibition space, I would love to do a free festival exhibition. How cool would that be to just do the story of the Battle of the Beanfield, the free festival, and like really explore that and maybe involve people who were there or can remember it not so much the food festival but <laughs> um, but yeah so yeah so I'd like to think that we can tackle some of those uh more sort of hidden aspects um the druid and pagan relations I probably glossed over it quite a lot we have a lot of regular meetings with those groups and their representatives from various different orders and groups and sections all come together at what we call our round table meetings which is where things like the solstice access is talked about and discussed and arranged um we met them I think twice in the development of the project and they're the only outside group that we met with so they were given a privileged access to what we were going to do in exhibition and we did talk to them quite extensively about what they wanted to have in that meaning section about kind of modern meanings but of course they don't agree because it's a number of different views about what it is and what it was for and what their belief systems are so it's very difficult to sum up in like a sentence what you know people think about Stonehenge so um I, I guess the, the human remains discussion became, we, we wanted to take it, we took it to them about a year before we opened, when we just got internal go ahead for putting human remains on display because of a whole series of internal discussions about it. And we um, met with them with the intention of discussing with them how to display the remains, what we could say, how we could do it respectfully, but the discussion never happened because they were so incensed at the first mention of it that they all kind of walked out. So we never managed to have those discussions. And the roundtable meetings still happen, the solstice discussions still happen. All of that, that access is never going to go away, you know, the winter and the sol summer solstice and the equinox access, which they, they have as well. Um, we, would, we would never go back on any of those decisions. If anything, we would hope to maybe at some point make it more, you know, more of those sort of events. But um, 
they're kind of two separate things in the way the discussion about the human remains and the discussion of the solstice there's a whole related issue of the reburial of the Aubrey Hole cremations which is you know another kind of element to the discussion but all of those things are kind of bubbling away and as far as I'm aware the only only protests we had were kind of at the opening and um, they've gone I mean we don't have any letters of complaint we don't have lots of people coming to us and saying we want to petition for reburial or taking things off display so until that happens we kind of assume that most people are okay with it and um, I mean there are various things like there's a sign when you go in saying there are human remains on display and um, we warn people on our website and you know all that kind of thing the standards sort of um, making sure that you, you warn people before they go in um, but um, I, I think that discussion is sort of at least settled down rather than gone away entirely. I'd be interested to know whether the Salisbury Museum have had any feedback and any other museums. I mean, Mary Rose, for example, have put human remains on display um, there, and they're obviously much more recent human remains, and they've done them in completely different ways than we have. So that you know, I'd be interested to know if they've had any feedback um, from other groups. Thank you. One last question at all in the crowd for Susan. <laughs> it struck me at the end there when you were describing the sort of Druidic and other community engagement, your discussion of them having conflicting opinions, everybody has a different one, is exactly the way the academics yes. were. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. all quite yeah. um, thank you so much for an absolutely brilliant talk, and I'm sure everybody agrees, incredibly yeah. informative, very meaningful. Thank you so much.